good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our 30th anniversary Dean's Interview Panel. I'm Professor Geraldine Doyle, Director of the UCD Michael Smurfit Graduate Business School and Associate Dean of the UCD College of Business. On behalf of the school, it's a wonderful pleasure to welcome you to this very special occasion for the school, marking a key milestone in the history of business education in Ireland, the 30th anniversary of the UCD Michael Smurfit Graduate Business School. While UCD's business education began over 110 years ago, it was on the 11th of October 1991 that the UCD Smurfit School opened its doors to welcome students to Ireland's first graduate business school. It remains the only dedicated graduate business school with its own campus, and I think we'll all admit a beautiful one at that. Originally, this beautiful Victorian building was designed for the Sisters of Mercy, who led Carysford College from 1877 until its closure in 1988 as a teacher training college. And we are very proud to continue the purpose of this campus in contributing to society through the education of leaders in Irish and global business. So the opening of the UCD Smurfit School was transformative, not only for the university, but also for Irish and global business community. Our new home has facilitated a significant expansion of postgraduate business programmes. Today we have 25 master's programmes, including those particularly relevant to the technology hub and the financial services hub, where leading global companies have located their European headquarters here in Dublin. And these two sectors are indeed the key employers of our graduates and alumni, and have been integral to Ireland's economic achievement in recent years. And in fact, most of the CEOs and the senior leadership teams of these European headquarters are indeed alumni of our school. So from a school comprising mainly Irish students in 1991, today we have 67 nationalities represented within our student cohort and also a significant portion of our faculty are also global and international. So to enhance our diversity, we recently signed a partnership agreement with Howard University in Washington, DC, a historically black college, another first for the UCD Smurfit School and a first for business schools across Ireland. As we look to the future, we continue to be ambitious for our students and thank you to our students who've joined us today. And we welcome the best and the brightest candidates from around the world. And indeed, we are ambitious for our academic community as we champion innovative research that will focus on business-related aspects of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, reflected in the four university strategic themes of creating a sustainable society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world, and empowering humanity. So before we begin, I would like to introduce you to our esteemed panel. First, we have our Dean through the formation of the UCD Smurfit School, Professor Aidan Kelly, who served as Dean from 1989 to 1995. So you're very welcome, Aidan. And in fact, my very first memory of Aidan was Aidan was the first person who greeted me on returning back uh, to UCD, uh, having been a student and a graduate, having worked in industry, and Aidan came out to welcome me and to greet me before introducing me to the interview panel who interviewed me back in 1992. So uh, it's lovely to have you back, Aidan. Um, and, of course, um, we are also delighted to welcome uh, Professor Philip Burke, who led the college from 1998 to 2004, which included the launch of the UCD Lachlan Quinn School. So, Philip, you're very welcome. Great to have you back, too. Um, and, of course, delighted to welcome uh, our esteemed colleague, Professor Mary Lankin, recently named as Ireland marketing champion at the 2022 All-Ireland Marketing Awards and Mary served as Dean 2005 to 2011. Thanks Mary. And of course our current Dean, Professor Tony Brabazon, uh, who began his tenure as Dean in 2018 and has successfully led the college through an enhanced period of globalisation and of course 
the challenges of our recent pandemic and the innumerable ripples it has created. Uh, so thank you, Tony, for your leadership during this very turbulent and challenging time. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce our esteemed host, Emmet, Emmet Oliver. Emmet is a business journalist and former editor of the Sunday Business Post. Emmet um, is also the host of our UCD Business Impact podcast. So I'm sure all of you have heard many of those podcasts, if not all of them, um, and is also a lecturer for us in business, media and communications at our UCD Lachlan School. So with great pleasure, I'll hand over to you, Emmet. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Thank you for the introduction and um, for these very esteemed uh, colleagues to my right. Um, they've often talked about what do you call it, a plural group of deans or a plural group of professors. Um, there was once a joke made by an Irish writer who said, when you bring Irish writers together in a, in a group situation, what do you call them? And he said, a jealousy of Irish writers. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any of those problems. There are no sharp elbowed people here today. Um, we're going to have a wonderful conversation. We'll be here till about two o'clock, just in terms of uh, housekeeping. So hopefully we'll keep you captivated and interested until then. And as Geraldine said, it's been a long 30 years. And I thought as, as an opener, just to get everyone kind of loosened up and bring them back to when the, the, the whole initiative started in 1991, October the 11th. So to give you an idea of what was going on in the world, I jotted down a few things that were happening in this period. And uh, some of this will fill into our conversation in a second. The Soviet Union was being dissolved. Um, which was interesting. The US president was George H. Bush and the Irish teacher of the time was Charles Hoppy. Um, the IRA campaign was still going on. Um, some mortars had been fired at 10 Downing Street. Um, the best-selling song was Brian Adams' Everything I Do For You, which personally <laughs> is a real dirge as far as I'm concerned, but uh, that was no reason to avoid the entire year. Uh, the Gulf War was taking place and something called the World Wide Web was being released for the first time um, to research Amazing. institutes all around the world, which is intriguing. A cult band from Seattle, uh, Washington State, called Nirvana, were releasing an album called Nevermind. And in the world of literature and the arts, we lost short story writer Sean O'Whelan, who passed away in 1991, but born that year from County Mayo was Sally Rooney. So uh, interesting how people are coming and going in the same field and who reached uh, distinguished later on. Inflation was at 4.2%. <laughs> what we wouldn't take for that now. Um, there was obviously no COVID, although there was a cholera outbreak taking place in Latin America at the time. And most importantly of all, the price of a pint of beer was one pound, Irish pound, and 52 pence. Sorry about that very much, okay? So a good and bad, a, a mixed bag in there, okay? But it gives you an idea of the rapid and extraordinary change we've been through over 30 years. I mean, just some of those stories give you some insight and illustration of the different tectonic plates moving around the world and these four people in their own ways were playing their own part in some of this history as he went along and as you can see from the architecture this is a former sisters of mercy and um, teacher training facility those of you um, who don't know as much about the history of it and it has that feel as you walk around the corridors you're expecting to to run into a nun in a habit somewhere around the uh, around the corner so it's an amazing environment but how did we get here and who brought us here? And who is the person responsible for the original genie of an idea? And that's where I thought I'd start the conversation with you, Aidan. Um, you are the person who certainly was among a group of people that were instrumental in setting this up. Can you take the audience back a little bit about, back to what business education was like at the time? And what were your goals with the idea of setting up a, a dedicated graduate facility, um, whether it was in Belfield or down here in the Smurford campus? What, what were you trying to achieve at the time? Um, well, first of all, I, I'd like to thank Tony and Geraldine for your very kind invitation to come along today. It's very nice to see many old faces, many of people I've, I've worked with um, and still keep in contact with some of you. Um, and it hasn't changed from the day we came in here. The facility is as, is, as it was then after renovation. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great credit to everybody that... It's maintained its position and, and <coughs> continues to grow. Um, I was fortunate at, at, at the time uh, to be in a position where this whole opportunity became available. But before that, um, I think it's important to put it into context um, that from a postgraduate education standpoint, you know, it all started with Michael McCormick in the 1960s with the 
development of the first MBA in Ireland, um, which was a pivotal moment in graduate business education. And then it was a very gradual sort of evolution then right through the 70s um, with the startup of the specialist master's programs in marketing and finance, um, HRM and so forth. And that continued on. Um, but we were in Belfield and it was a very, we had a, we had a very small area to ourselves in Belfield. I would say that in terms of the capacity, um, we had two rooms of about 30 student capacity available for the MBA program and that was it. And that, that was an evening program and that, then they would be available for the start of the specialist postgraduate during the day. So, so we were very constrained. Now, of course, the demand for business education then was not as it is nowadays. Um, but right through the 70s and 80s, there was a gradual build-up. Um, business education was becoming more, let's say, the perceptions among people generally about business, the idea of business education and postgraduate business education became a lot more positive. Um, and so it was quite buoyant um, in Belfield at that time. And then... Um, I would say that the starting point, really, for me, as, as far back as I can recall, was Paddy Masterson was president from, I think, 1986 to 1993 or so. And I would, I would regard Paddy Masterson as the first president who looked outside the university. He, was, he had a very external orientation. Uh, he was the first who really integrated uh, with the business community. Um, and he decided to engage in a transformation of the university. And he asked every faculty to put forward their ambition about what they wanted to do. And every faculty did. Um, and we put forward the idea that we would like to have a separate Graduate School of Business, on the Belfield campus. There was no, no talk about Carysford. And he formulated then this, what I think is probably the first strategic plan for the university. That, that concept was unknown <coughs> in the university. But, um, you know, Paddy was interacting with a lot of business people. And he, he began to acquire this sort of terminology and began to understand these things. And he put this plan together. And uh, he published it, and on page nine, whatever it was for the Commerce Faculty, we were going to have this new school. It was just an aspiration. It was an idea. There was no substance there at all. Um, but once it, it got a bit of traction then, because then Paddy went out and started looking for money, looking for support. And <coughs> Michael Smurfett became interested um, through the good offices, I think, of Dermot Desmond at the time. Um, so Paddy was quite well connected in these areas. And he indicated some, you know, that he, he would be, with the right idea, he would come forward with maybe some seed funding. And that evolved into um, a decision to build a business school on the Belfield campus. And in fact, in 1989, around that time, plans actually were commissioned. Um, it was going to be a small building, three stories, um, not very big. Uh, you could probably, three times the size of this room, maybe, would be the size of it. That was the ambition. But it was separate, it was dedicated, it was going to be independence away from, you know, the arts faculty smothering us. Um, we wanted to get out and have our own area of operation. Anyhow, um, and did you find, and did learned, you find much pushback from UCD central administration oh yeah, to this idea? Yeah. There, there was, yeah, there was a lot of pushback from the centre because uh, what I didn't mention was, you know, f since the early 1950s, successive presidents had embarked on this whole move out from the city centre 
to the Belfield campus. I'm not sure when the campus was bought, but it was bought in, in pieces of old estates right throughout the 50s and 60s. And science moved out in the late 50s, I think, early 60s. Um, and, but the whole philosophy was we're moving everything out. Earlsford Terrace, the engineering school, the old architecture school, all, everything was going to be concentrated into Belfield. Um, and that was, the, that was the big plan. Um, and you got, I believe you got Paddy Masterson to use a computer to get the money, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, was, he was very concerned about how could he persuade Michael Smurford to come up with the goods. And he was advised by Dermot Desmond, who was then very closely connected with Michael Smurford, but he would be very much the junior um, entrepreneur at that stage. Uh, Michael was so far ahead of everybody else, you know, so he was, he was a godlike figure. Um, so Paddy was very nervous about trying to, you know, get the thing right, get it absolutely right, get the presentation right. And Dermot Desmond came up with this idea that we're going to have this presentation on a computer. Now, Paddy never had a computer, never, never used a computer, mm-hmm. no more than many other people did. Um, so this was all put together, and he was taught how to make the presentation, press the right buttons. You know. <laughs> I'm not even sure PowerPoint was available at that time. I don't think it was pre-PowerPoint. Um, so, anyhow... But it must Michael, have worked, right? I mean. Michael Smurfett was really impressed, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, um, so he came up with a, a million and a half euro at that time. And that was to build that school on the Belfield campus. And at that time, same time then, Lawrence Crowley was um, appointed as the executive director of this new business school. The painting of whom we've got at the back of the room for and anyone. This is yeah. the room named after Lawrence. And that was another pivotal moment um, because here we had a person, not an academic, coming in from outside long, um, successful business career, and now coming in and maybe stirring things up and maybe getting us a bit more integrated with the business community and so forth. Um, And as you would expect, there was an element of resistance around that as well. Um, But then there was, then we move on to Carisford and how that happened. um, It was accidental, it was opportunistic, whatever, Turn you want to use, but I do remember the day we were in Roebuck Castle as a transition arrangement to move from the arts block until this new business school was built. And Lawrence was up there on his own in his big office, and I went to see him one day, and he said, "You know," he said, "This came in, but the letterbox this morning, and it was a, a brochure sent by um, Finton Gunn, who was the chief executive." of the Gunn Property Company, uh, who was aware that the business school was, was going to be built. Uh, and he had this on his books, he had, and he couldn't sell it. it had, he'd been trying to sell it for several years. The property market had collapsed. Uh, the person who owned it at that time um, wanted to get rid of it um, and was prepared to take a loss, whatever. Um, and the nuns, they had passed on the property at, at, at that stage to this um, potential developer. Um, and so Lawrence said, we, we might as well have a look. So we went, three or four of us went down here, had a look. And I can tell you this, on the first day, not, we didn't have the ability to make any decisions. We had no money. Um, we hadn't even spoken to the president about it. We came down, walked around the place, and uh, it was nothing like this. I mean, it was literally falling apart. Uh, it, it was not... It, you know, it wouldn't pass any health and safety or fire precautions, whatever you like mm-hmm. nowadays. I do remember we went down to um, what was then the old Dunn's cafeteria down in Black Rock. And we sat down and had a cup of coffee. And the four of us sat around the table and said, what do you think? And this included the buildings officer from um, Belfield, um, Lawrence, myself, and there's another colleague. And without disclosing who said what, but three out of four said, this is it, we're going to go for it. Who was the other one? <laughs> <laughs> um, we went back and went to see Paddy Masterson. Um, 
I don't think Paddy Masters didn't know what to do because he was caught with his idea. He says, I know, he says, this is going to be real trouble. <laughs> he says, I've spent all my life and my predecessors have spent their life trying to come out of the city centre, to come into Belfield, to centralise everything. Mm. Now, you are going in the opposite direction. You are going away from Belfield. Um, so, um, but Paddy could see the potential. And, and Michael Smurford, when, when Michael Smurford heard of this and came to see it, he said there was no question. He said, that's where I want my money put to. And we won't go into the long story about how we acquired this place eventually for, exec for nothing, because the government came up with Charlie Howe. It's a very long mentioned. political controversy, which is so long we Another don't have time to go into which, uh, it, <laughs> it's fortunately. Um, the if I could... Council Committee visited here on a couple of occasions, I can tell you that. Um, but anyhow... Uh, you got there. Uh, that we got there, yeah. If I can move on to Philip for a second, because, um, Philip, I think you made a few visits here as well, and just to give people an idea, there was sort of cows and fields and nuns out in the, doing the work. And I mean, this really was a working site before you came down here. Well, yeah, the nuns had sold, <coughs> excuse me, had sold this building, but they had kept uh, the, the land, a lot of the, most of the land around it, and it was still a working, a working farm. And I still have a vision of a nun in her habit out there, way over there, uh, supervising workers, make, collect, I mean, making the hay. Uh, so they were still around for quite a few, quite a few years uh, afterwards. I think they were all enthusiastic about it being kept in uh, being kept in education and you would often see nuns coming back uh, and you would see teachers who are trained here coming back with their kids too. Uh, and what did you make personally of the move to here? Did you think it was a good idea yourself as, as, as a staff member at the time or did you have to be convinced? Or did no, you just... no, I didn't have to be convinced uh, because, well, I, I had always a slightly more radical view than many of my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my view was that yes, we should have graduate school of business but that it also should be independent, a bit mm. like the College of Surgeons. Mm. And uh, that was one of the, the big plays of my life that I didn't uh, <laughs> manage to pull off. Uh, but it did go to a, I mean, anyway, long story short, it went to a committee eventually to keep me quiet. They had a committee set up and said, I know. But, anyway, but that was my vision of an independent thing that would be outside of the controls of, of government, which weren't bad then now, but I, you, know, you could see that they were, uh, they, were, they, were, they were going to build up. And uh, it's no secret in my mind that the preeminent college of medicine uh, in, the, in the country is the College of Surgeons. Um, which was why Mary <laughs> developed the MBA with the, with the uh, health MBA with the College of Surgeons uh, back, back in the day uh, as well. So, uh, you know, that, that was... And you, you were heavily involved in the internationalisation of the college. I know you, you were very active in getting students and staff and faculty over here. Was that in, embedded in the Smurfit thing from the start or did that sort of come a few years later? And what, what was the mm. thinking around that? Well, I, I think, to be honest with you, I mean, Aidan, as, as is usual, is a little bit modest. Aidan had a couple of, a whole lot of ideas, but one of them was we had to be international. Uh, he, he, you know, he was much closer to educational thinking than I was, but he had this idea that, you know, education should be internationalised. So I, I sort of, to myself, I guess, if Aidan figures that's the way to go, this is the way to go. So. We started to uh, we started to do that, and obviously now, if you want to internationalise, you've got to be you've got to have benchmarks and accreditation and all this kind of stuff. And I've said told this little story before, um, but uh, I was in Paris. I used to teach in Paris part time as a kind of a an ixer, and uh, it's a long ago now. But I mean, there were four, three others teaching there. Aidan was teaching there, uh, Peter Clark from accounting, uh, Eleanor O'Higgins, and they made up forty percent of the MBA program of. Uh, which was a, maybe the third, second or the third business school in France, you know. And uh, one day I, was, I, I saw a little notice on the wall and it said, um, we've been ranked in the top 80 or something like that in the world by the Fin Times. And I said to myself, gee, if these guys can get ranked number 80 in the world with 40% of their faculty made up by UCD staff, what do you think? A, u a university or a business school with 100% UCD staff could do. <laughs> and that is true. So I said, listen, we're, we're going to get, we're gonna get uh, ranked. And of course, well, there was a little bit of uh, opposition, but uh, at the same time, we went for accreditation. I mean, there were a lot of things we did, for instance, like semesterization. Mm. And we ran semesterization for, I don't know, three or four years with the rest of the university going on the old mm. route. Now it seems so simple, but why, why you wouldn't do it? But, that was the kind of university it was. They said, okay, well, listen, if you guys want to do it, even though it was incredibly complicated for the administration of the exams, 
Oh, okay. I mean, they weren't, they didn't have their eye on the ball then as they do now, I think. So it was a lot easier to do things, get the proper paperwork in and it got approved and people weren't looking at it so much. Now it's a, it's a lot different. Tony has a much tougher job than, yes. than we ever had, you know. And we'll get him to talk about that in a few minutes. <laughs> tell, us, tell us all. Uh, Mary, if I can bring you into the conversation, <clears throat> one of the things, so you've got students, now you're going international but obviously the, the offering, the course offering that's available has to expand as well. You've got to be more diverse. And I think one of the things that the, the school at the time wanted to do was reflect the foreign direct investment flows into the country and have courses that were sort of picking up on that theme. And I know that that's where you came in with the digital technology piece in particular. And I think that was seen as some, somewhat of an inflection point in the, the evolution of the school. Would you agree with that looking back now? Well, I, I hope it is because uh, it's nice to be associated with something that turns out to be successful because there's lots of initiatives we try and that some don't work out and it's great that some do. Um, I, I probably would go back even before the digital marketing to the MBA. Uh, for example, I, I've always been interested in the, what was going on down at the IFSC. And we talked for a long time about uh, what would be nice for the school here to have some connection with the IFSC. And uh, by, uh, bit of ingenuity, we managed to get an MBA going down there. First of all, working with KPMG, who lent us a seminar room. And then we morphed into a, a bigger unit, of which was provided by the Institute of Bankers. And we ran that program for a long time. So it was kind of a first step in actively interacting with an area of big investment that was going on. And in a way, I suppose that gave me some experience of dealing with the companies that were on the side of the Liffey there. And I was also very interested, of course, in all the digital development. And uh, I had been down to see Google and Facebook and these places, and I realized how huge they were and how much they were growing. And the funny thing, I used to get uh, approaches from professors in other European business schools quite often saying, I'm bringing my MBA class to Dublin to visit Google and Facebook. Any chance you'd like to put on a seminar to fill out their schedule for the week? And they wanted us to do this as a, an act of uh, <laughs> just kindness, you know. And I thought, well, if all of these other business schools around Europe know that Dublin has a reputation as a real centre for digital business. Uh, surely we here at home should be leveraging this for our own benefit and trying to you know, build the interaction. And of course, it always ends up being two ways, you know, that we want to get some benefits from them, but equally they want to hire our graduates and to be involved in lots of other ways, research and so on. So uh, that just led me to think, the, the best way to get going, and often the best way to get going, I think, in the business school, is to start a programme in the topic that you want to promote. So I put together a, a curriculum for an MSc in digital marketing. And <laughs> the normal way when you're starting to work up a programme like that, you'd say, oh, who's doing it elsewhere? And have we some kind of model to go on, preferably from some very reputable, you know, business school internationally. And I searched and I searched and I couldn't find anything. So it ended up I had to just use the best uh, idea I had myself about what should go into that program. And there were quite a few short courses downtown uh, popping up on social media and how to do that kind of social media communication as a marketing tool. But I felt that was a very narrow view I had a much kind of uh, wider view, which is to think of it as a whole sort of supply chain, all the way from procurement to operations, to distribution, to uh, CRM and media being just the end point. So we sort of built the curriculum around that wider supply chain kind of view of digital business more than digital marketing per se. And we got it going. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And now it is a very large program. And I think some of the students sitting here may be part of that uh, student group this year, of whom there are nearly 200. And there is so much demand and you know, so many applications every year that in point of fact, I think we could probably fill it twice over if we had the capacity. So maybe we need to extend the business school a bit more than your original <laughs> planning. Well, you know the two people to do it, don't they? <laughs> 
And to describe these two men beside you, I mean, they, they, they sound like they were able to push the boundaries a bit in terms of college mm -hmm. administration. Do you think that was the key to getting the thing up and running, the way they operated, or what, what do you think? This Absolutely. I, I very much agree with Philip's uh, description where he says it was kind of an atmosphere of benign indifference in a way. You know, that there wasn't a master plan. I mean, you say Paddy Masterton. Paddy Masterson had a strategic plan for the university, but I had a sense that there was a fairly benign indifference that if you came up with something, there might be a little bit of a murmur of dissent just because it was new and we all are inclined to resist change, but that by and large you could do anything that you could make a good case for. And I think that is still the case, that probably people don't think of, say, a university or certainly a business school as entrepreneurial in the sense of the digital businesses and the, all the ones that we have uh, here in Ireland. But actually, it is very entrepreneurial. If you look at all the new things that have been done and how it reached out internationally and all these different things, that it adds up to a catalogue of very exciting development, really, all of which was led by individual people who just had a passion for something and if they had the get up and go to make it happen, nobody held them back. And that's how things got done. And Aidan, in terms of, um, you also did, Philip was involved as well, you did something that was very different, is you brought people from the business community into the university environment, which might seem a very ordinary, commonplace thing to do, but it wasn't then. And some academics can be, um, you know, a little bit sensitive about the, the business world coming directly into the business school. Obviously, Lawrence Crowley is at the, in the painting at the back. Can you just tell me about why you did that and what did people think of the idea of having people who weren't, you know, directly, they weren't academics, the coming into the business school and having an influence over the evolution of the college? Were, was people happy with this internally or was this I, sort I of seen it, as a peculiar thing to do at the time? Yeah, I, th I think Lawrence, in the, at the very early stage, was, was very concerned <clears throat> to break down that, that wall between, let's say, the business community and the academic side of things. And um, he's, he came up with this idea of, having, of, of, of uh, establishing a board, a board of advisors who would be mainly from the business community. Uh, that, was, that was a radical idea at that time. I think the only other university that, that had that that I can recall was the London Business School. I don't think any other UK or the other um, European university had anything like that at that time. So this board had maybe 25 or 30 of the most prominent business people from all sectors of business at that time. And then, I mean, hardly had that sort of settled down. And he came up with the idea that we'll have a North American board. And, you know, this is so radical, it's, it's, it's quite unbelievable. Nowadays, we take it for granted. And so Lawrence took the school across the Atlantic, if you like, and um, we had, you know, regular meetings in main cities um, in America. A lot of it had to do with fundraising, and, 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 and we did get a lot of support over the years from the North American board. And, and those boards now, I understand, they meet together at least once a year. Um, and even still today, you still find many business schools haven't even come that far. Um, and I think that's what makes um, what makes this school unique in, in, in many ways that that connection with business and then so many then so many people have graduated out of Smurfit over the last 25 30 years and they're also now you know scattered all around not just in Ireland but all across Europe and Asia and um, and, and there you know they, they, that, that connection continues um, so it, it, it's, it's been an incredible transformation and, and that's, that's where I think that the whole internationalization idea has come full circle, finally. Um, and now you can see it. I mean, when I walk in here today, um, I would say maybe 70% of the students I've seen, now maybe the Irish students are somewhere else, but they're mostly international. <laughs> they're in is, Megaloo. <laughs> which, which is great to see, you know, and, it, it's, and that, that makes for a very different teaching environment and a student um, experience. And Philip, um, I, I mentioned, as I said, some of those economics factoids, I suppose you could call them, about what was going on at the time. 
unemployment, I think, in Ireland in 1987 was like over 20%, which is un unbelievable, yeah. right? Obviously, we're talking about 1991. We hadn't really entered the full throes of the Celtic Tiger at that stage. I mean, just give people an idea in the audience, and we do, have, we have a lot of younger people here and students and so on, just, you know, the difficult economic climate and how that played into getting a business school up and running. Like, what kind of people, why were people studying what they were studying at the time? What were they trying to do? What, what, what was going on in terms of the linkage between the economy and business education? Well, but basically, students were trying to get jobs in England, basically, you know, and... Uh, that was, that was the game plan. And actually, I, looking back on it, or even at the time, I, I think I figured we figured that it, this was to our advantage because uh, uh, people didn't fully realise that Dublin was, the, was the, uh, the, the, the biggest recruiting centre for English recruiters outside of Oxford, Cambridge together. So, I mean, everybody used to come to Dublin. And so, I mean, our job was to create... But I, they used to, because it was handy, they used to meet... Uh, down, downtown uh, and so that was close to Trinity so I, I figure we had to uh, you know really establish ourselves as the place uh, uh, as the place to come so but anyway uh, you know the, the, all of the things came together the unemployment uh, it was encouraging students to qualify themselves up uh, to compete with um, not alone other Irish students but also with English students uh, who didn't typically do a, a master's so it all kind of played uh, into it, uh, you know, the, funnily enough. Uh, the, uh, and then, of course, we were developing the overseas programmes, which were generating the resources to help us to, to, do, uh, to, to, do, uh, to do all of this. And another decision which uh, we... Well, there were a couple of... The, one decision which we kind of made was to price things, you know, in keeping with a premium product. I mean, the price things were premium product. We had the, the, the old master management, it was called, I forget what it was, it was called the MIM, the ma no, it was Diploma in, what do you call it, Aidan, the Diploma? Your invention. Yeah. Studies. Uh, the Diploma in Business, that was another of Aidan's inventions. But anyway, it was on a government, it was on a government scheme and it was free. Um, and we took a decision to say, hey, well, no, we're getting out of the government scheme and we're going to price this at a significant chunk of money back then. And lo and behold, the enrolments rose. Mm. You know, the, all the messaging was coming together. Uh, you know, people were saying, oh, blah, blah, blah. No, but all the messaging was coming together to say, you know, this is a premium product. You got a premium, uh, you know, you got a premium facility around here. You got a, very, a premium faculty. And, uh, you know, you gotta, that's got to be, be paid for. So, you know, there are endless numbers of little decisions mm. that all kind of fed into... Sure. Uh, well, one of the ones I want to zone in on, and I'm going to come to you then, I'm keeping you to last, Tony, <laughs> um, <laughs> for, to bring us up to date with today and, and the future. But, Mary, very briefly, um, the, the marketing of Smurfit, like, even if you've never walked into UCD, everyone has heard of Smurfit, and it's been reduced down to one word, right? The UCD bit sometimes falls out. <laughs> And it's Smurfit, I'm going to Smurfit, I'm doing a course, I graduated from Smurfit, I was at Smurfit. It just, and there's not many in any university, college or school that has that thing. Was that a conscious branding thing? Did it just evolve that way? Did someone make a very purposeful decision to, to bring that about? How did it, as a marketeer, you, I mean, you're probably watching these things over the years. And how oh, I am, and I, I was a little bit involved in it along the way too. So it was a very interesting case study, a real life case study for ourselves. Um, it was partly planned and partly fortuitous, I would say. On the one hand, that with the Smurfit name, and it was early on decided it was carrying the Smurfit name, you already had a very strong brand name because it was such a big company and so internationally successful. So you were working with something that was a help, you know, that you had an asset uh, there that was well known. The other thing that I personally think was very important, and one reason why I liked coming here is that this looks like an Ivy League school. That if you've ever visited, if you've visited the Harvard Business School or the London Business School or, you know, various uh, highly, highly regarded schools, we talk about Ivy League and this literally looked the part. And so we had the pictures, the visual images and everything put together with the well-known Smurfit name gave you a sort of natural advantage to start with. But also, uh, uh, when we came here, I don't know who were the brave pe people that uh, made the decision, but we actually hired professional marketing people. We had Neve Boyle and we had Neve Hooley and so on. And we put a budget together to allow money to be spent to prepare beautiful visual materials and websites, obviously, when we got to that stage that schools had those. 
and really invested in building the brand in a proper professional marketing way. And then, of course, the product sells itself and you build a bigger audience of people who know the programs, who are out there, and there's a word of mouth effect that gains momentum. So that kind of momentum picked up by itself and built upon our early marketing efforts. So it was like a confluence of events, but it's a wonderful thing to see Ireland having such a strong brand now and attracting people from literally all over the world. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, and it's, it's great to see that, that confidence being placed in, in the efforts. And um, you can see Audrey and Beth clapping away enthusiastically <laughs> at, at every the yeah, path you've, yeah, you've been yeah. making. Um, <laughs> but bringing us on to today, um, Tony, Thanks for coming along, first of all. It's great to take a, a trip down memory lane. I'm sure some of this is familiar territory to you. I suppose everyone in the room wants to know where the future is for the, for the, for the school and, and building on the legacy that uh, Aidan and Philip have been talking to Mary as well. I mean, you have many things about empowering and connecting and co-creation with the outside world. There's a lot going on. You've got a lot of students here now. Um, we've come through COVID very, very much intact. And, you know, you know how bumpy it's been, but equally... Um, the, the student numbers and, and the quality of the research that are coming out of the school are, are also showing that COVID didn't set us back um, hugely, although it was a difficult time for everyone and continues to be. What do you see in your sort of crystal ball for the school in the next few years as much as you can? And are a lot of the same teams you're expecting to see going to be kind of building on these earlier years, do you think? I think it's a really exciting time for the school and looking and hearing you know, the history of over the last uh, couple of decades, as um, has been mentioned by you know, Aidan, Philip and Mary, I see us very much continuing on in the same, um, in, in the same vein. If you just pick on some of the key words that have been mentioned, uh, one key f uh, comment that's come out is the idea of the school being a global or an international school. And that's, that's, that, that's who we are and what we are at the, at the moment. That's more important than ever. If we look at the whole geopolitical situation in the broader world, globalization and respect for other cultures has never been as important as it is now. So that's really, really something that you know, we need to focus on the school. And the school is a means of bringing people from different cultures together, uh, encouraging people to understand other perspectives. Another unique aspect of the environment in which we find ourselves, and this has come out over our discussions of the journey of the school over the last 30 years, is the school has adapted over time to the economic environment w within Ireland. And what I mean by that is, if you go back about 30 years, the employment possibilities for people coming out with master's degrees from the Smurfield School were quite limited in a very, very depressed Irish economy. And I remember graduating from the BCom in 1988, and about 70% of my class emigrated straight away. That, that, that was the Irish economy in the 1980s. Things were a touch better by 91, but, but, but not a lot. But what's happened over the last 30 years? Well, there has been a huge influx of uh, foreign direct investment, and it's changed its nature significantly from the foreign direct investment that we saw during the 60s and 70s and 80s in Ireland, away from assembly-type operations, away from very back-office-type of operations, to what we see now uh, are leading tech companies, leading financial services companies, healthcare companies, professional services firms, who actually have innovation uh, laboratories here in Ireland. So Ireland has gone from simply doing back office work to actually having cutting edge innovation, which is feeding into the global networks of, 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 the, of, these, uh, of these particular firms. And we're feeding directly into that. Our graduates are going in to these jobs in leading, in leading global um, companies. That's created kind of a magnet effect. So the number of international students that um, I would meet uh, in the corridors who would say to me that, well, one of the reasons I came to, uh, to Smurfit, to Dublin, was because of the employment opportunities I have after I leave in really globally relevant firms in growth sectors uh, is very significant. It's a major draw for people coming to Ireland. But of course, this is synergistic. Talent coming into the school also creates talent for these firms to grow in the future. So there's a very, very synergistic, positive reinforcement cycle go going on here. I think the other thing I would draw out from the earlier conversation that's been very important for us in terms of our strategy going forward is the idea of, of connectedness. And this really speaks to the history of the school and I think uh, issues that we've held very dear. So we've always had a very, very strong connection with practice. So we believed in academically rigorous education, but also education which is 
practically relevant. So if I look across our programs at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, we, we go through very, very regular review cycles for those programs where they're pretty much revamped in their entirety at least every five years. And that's done with our own academics looking at them in conjunction with our students, with our alum, but critically as well with input from, um, from, from, from industry. I think it's interesting in the context as well of Smurfit and our, and our portfolio 25 programs, a significant number of those programs are less than 10 years old. They have been created in response to evolving um, industry, uh, industry needs. And the other comment that I think uh, Aidan made in terms of connectivity was, we've been around a long time. We have 110 years of history, and we have about 100,000 graduates from the College of Business in its entirety, about 30-odd thousand from Smurfit since Smurfit was formed in, in, in 91. So many of the people in leading roles in global companies, which have the European headquarters in Dublin, are our own alums. So we actually are one phone call away from very, very senior people in these companies. We're two phone calls away from the centre of Europe. So this is a school which, although it's geographically a bit distanced from Brussels, it actually is much, much closer to centres of power in terms of business, in terms of government, non-governmental organisations and so on, than most business schools are. And that could then gives us a real opportunity to have leverage in the future and impact through our education and through the influence of our research in terms of policy making and also on practice in, in these firms. So I'm really, really excited as to the next uh, 10 or 15 years that we see ahead of us, because what we're actually seeing now are decades of work from people sitting on this panel, but, but probably more importantly, from hundreds and thousands of staff and colleagues over, um, over the decades who have made and implemented the myriad of decisions that have brought us to where we are, uh, to where we are today. And I think we truly can be a business school that has global impact and influence in a way that few other business schools have the opportunity to do, given where we are located. We are really at this really, you know, really, really, uh, really critical point in terms, of, uh, in terms of interactivity with the sectors that actually matter in the world today. Health, technology, financial services and food. We have real strengths in this school across all, across all of those areas. And in terms of the, I'd be very excited anyway. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot on there. Yeah, it's a big menu. And then in terms of the student body, we've got some of them here, obviously. What changes have you noticed about, about the people that come here to study, or what kind of sort of trends have you seen? Because you've sort of observed a, a, a change over the years. I mean, what 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 are what are students? How are they different? What are they looking for? What's their their, their requirements compared to say a decade ago, and the, the kind of students that uh, Aidan and Philip would have been uh, dealing with. Well, the most, the most obvious thing we've seen over the last, um, over the last three decades since we founded the Smurfit School is that the, inter- that the student body has become far more international. Far more international. It varies a little bit from year to year, and COVID has been a bit disruptive over the last couple of years mm. in terms of, in terms of um, you know, percentage of intake coming from different countries. Because some countries are more affected by COVID and travel restrictions than others. But approximately 60 to 70% of the Smurfit School intake every year now is, uh, is international. And I see that, as, as I said, as a really positive thing because we would not have the economic miracle that we have in Ireland and Dublin if we did not have really ambitious, talented people coming in from, uh, from overseas to study with us and then going on to work uh, in, uh, in, in international firms based, uh, based in Ireland. Another important trend I've seen, which is very, very welcome, is that we have seen a bouncing up of gender of our intake as well. So this year, I think for the first time ever, uh, we have tipped over the 50% female intake into Smurf. I think it's approximately 55% uh, female, 45% uh, male this year, which is actually the, the, the flip of what we are at undergraduate level. At undergraduate level, it's still a little bit uh, male uh, dominated. It's about 45% female, 55% uh, 55% male. So that has been a change. That wouldn't have been the case. Wouldn't have been the case 20 years ago. And I just think. Sorry to interrupt you, but I do feel I need to say I was the only woman in the MBA when I was there. (laughs) (laughs) And I was only the second woman ever in the programme. The previous first lady was a nun who was the general manager of one of the big hospitals downtown. So just to point out, the change is pretty dramatic. <laughs> sure, sure. And I think you, you make a very, a very good point there, Mary, as well, that, of course, the, the change in terms of gender balance has not just occurred at student level. It's been something we're working on in terms of faculty um, faculty as well. So in terms of faculty, it's approximately 38% um, female, 52, or 62% um, 52% uh, male. 
Now, there is one other important characteristic that has changed over the last 10 years. We have all changed. So in terms of society, uh, society, our expectations, our ambitions are not where they would have been you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So we hear a lot of labels put on people now, and the common one now in terms of people who are in their early 20s is Gen, is Gen Z. And there are some kind of broad characteristics associated with that, including ambition. Also the fact that anyone starting to study with us now at undergrad to postgraduate level is a digital native. They have never known a world where they have not been connected. Now, for dinosaurs like me, um, that's, that's a little bit hard to conceive because I, I remember when I started in UCD, I was sharing, I was in 1992, and Aidan was the person who actually interviewed me uh, when, I came, when I came to UCD uh, applying for a lecturing job. But when I started in UCD, I shared an office uh, with a colleague, uh, Dave Darcy, from, uh, from MIS. Uh, and Dave was one of only about four or five people in the faculty at that time who had access to email. So I was there working away in my word star, looking over at Dave's shoulder at a strange thing called, uh, ca called email. So the, the world is completely different now in terms of our connectedness and the students that we have coming, coming through undergraduate and coming into our pre-experience programs are, are, are digital native. And finally, and really importantly, uh, for us as educators and also in terms of um, thinking of uh, policy impact, one thing I really notice about our, our student base now is that it's very interested in purpose and impact. So it's interested in issues such as sustainability. It's interested in making the world a better place. It's not simply about maximizing the salary I will get six months from now. People, I think, have a, have a, broader, a broader perspective. And that's actually a very, I think, very healthy from a societal point of view because now we're much more concerned about issues such as business and society and the appropriate role of business and business in society and we're seeing push coming through appropriately from our students and also from our younger faculty to make our courses uh, not just relevant, uh, but also to ensure that we are infused with a sense of, uh, a sense of purpose and, and, and business, and business, uh, biz business for good. So uh, there are a lot of changes. Yeah, that's not, interesting. Not yeah. that's, that's, sometimes you don't notice them when you're, you're sort of there. Um, we're coming towards the bit of a time um, break, so I just wonder, is there anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question of our four panellists? Wants to make a comment, an observation, say something they've noticed in the evolution of the school here? Anyone? Yeah, Maeve at the back there, yeah. Maeve Hulan there, yeah. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to hear the conversation, and um, as, the as the years get dropped, we all get dated, but I was thinking, I was lucky to be a student of this school in 91, 92, um, so was one of the population that we're speaking about coming in to experience this place for the first time. I came up from a, an unknown place called, I think it might have been the University of Limerick, but nevertheless. <laughs> uh, uh, but I had, I, I particularly remember being in Aidan's class, Aidan, and, and being surrounded by people. And you, you, we were over in the white uh, buildings across the way in classrooms there. You were teaching cases like People Express and General Electric. And you were telling us stories, and you would then you would tell a story, and then you'd sit back, lean on the desk, and you'd point at someone in the room, and expect them to have an opinion on the case. And I suppose it was it was that first experience of really being challenged to have a view that is really my lasting impression of what I gained from this school. It really was about gaining confidence. And everything that has been said is very true. You know, there was no idea of what we might do otherwise other than maybe go over to England and try and find a job. But suddenly, to be in a conversation uh, with other people who had the capacity or the expectation that we should think bigger was very powerful. Um, and I also would like to... I mean, there was many, many memories from that time, but another that comes to mind is being in Jim Crowley's class, challenged, in, uh, challenged to think about business policy, or Teresa Brannock's class, being thought, thought about research methods and taught how to think and to question and think critically. So really great experiences. Um, and I just want to thank you all for that. And to remember, you know, that we, we share together here. There's lots of other people. I see John McCallig, Paul, you know, lot, lots of us are, who were dated from that time, carbon dated maybe, <laughs> um, but I think we hold a, an important institutional memory, but we're joined by so many colleagues who've bought 
new and international and global perspectives, but that DNA around building your confidence, thinking bigger, having a point of view, and beginning to think globally was really important. So thank you all. Anybody else want to contribute to the conversation? Don't be shy. Never thought I'd find academics not able to speak. This, is, <laughs> this has definitely never happened before. Okay, well, if everyone wants to um, move on, I'm going to hand over to Geraldine to make the final um, goodbyes and so on. And thank you very much for our four speakers today. They've been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful conversation uh, trip down memory lane, which was really fabulous. And then also to hear from Tony in terms of um, our vision for the future. So, um, and thank you, Emmett, for, for hosting us. Um, and as we are here um, in this beautiful room, um, we it would be remiss, and I know you've already mentioned uh, Lawrence Crowley, uh, Emmett as well, but um, just to remember Lawrence, and he was uh, so important and so instrumental um, in the foundation of the UCD Smurfit School. Uh, he passed away um, about 18 months ago, and um, right until then, um, he was a real friend and supporter of the school. Um, I think he came to every single social event and board meetings and everything uh, that we had right up until uh, the few months before he passed away. So, um, so we'd like to acknowledge Lawrence, uh, CBE and founder chairman of the UCD Smurfit School, um, from whom this uh, room is named. And Lawrence, as we've heard from the conversation from um, Aidan and Philip, had a profound impact on every detail of the foundation of the school. And we certainly would not have been able to achieve all that we have uh, without his support throughout the years. Um, and in fact, he did help us to create that bridge that you talked about, Aidan, that bridge between the school and academia um, and the business community, which very much lies at the heart of the UCD Smurfit School today. Um, so we'd also like to uh, take a moment also to uh, thanks our fabulous host, uh, Emmett, um, and our esteemed panellists, um, Professors Aidan Kelly, Philip Burke, Mary Lampkin and Tony Brabazon. And our story is one of evolutionary adaptation, uh, as uh, we heard from Tony earlier in terms of embracing change um, and, um, and, and mapping ourselves and adapting um, and ensuring that our students can uh, be versatile, be agile um, and adapt to the changing world uh, that you're going to experience, that we all experienced over the last two years. And that continues to be our vision um, for leadership um, for the future. So for the next phase of the school, and Tony's already talked about how excited we are uh, in terms of looking to the next 30 years of the UCD Smurfit School is set out in our strategy, which is almost finalised, but we're at a, a near final draft stage at the moment to 2026. Um, and we want to be a business school with purpose, um, globally connected, a research intensive business school with its home here in the dynamic European capital of Dublin. Um, and we seek to actively inspire and to co-create, as Tony has talked about, a better future for everybody here for our students who are here with us today, uh, for our faculty and staff, our alumni, and indeed for business and society in Ireland and the world. So as Estonius highlighted and, and Emmet uh, in terms of um, what our, our mission is for the future is to empower everybody, uh, to connect and uh, to, to leverage those fantastic connections we have with over our 100,000 alumni globally um, and to co-create with all of our alumni, our students and all our stakeholders. So we're seeking to really co-create to shape that better future. Uh, if we can create a better future by working together, by collaborating together and creating a transformational learning environment for our students um, with new knowledge created by our stellar faculty and to ensure that we do have and try to create that positive impact on everybody's lives and society. So to you, our audience, to our fabulous students uh, who have joined us today, uh, to uh, our wonderful faculty um, and, uh, and colleagues as well. Uh, thanks so much, and alum as well. We have some fabulous alum. Um, and uh, talking earlier to um, uh, Jacqueline, uh, who uh, 
arrived this morning from Waterford um, and Jacqueline um, did, was the first class uh, who studied here in the UCD Smurfa School, the first part of her MBA. Uh, she started up in Belfield and then finished it down here. Uh, so, uh, so thanks so much to our alumni for joining us as well. Thanks everyone.